Good afternoon and well done for making it to the end. Uh, uh, it all sounds very profound, doesn't it? Neurodiversity, what the heck's that all about? Well, actually, some people will know very well what I'm talking about and other people maybe not have heard of it at all. But I hope the fact that you've stuck around to the end is that you'll get something a little bit different out of it. It's sort of deliberately left field. I know today you've heard a lot about brand and content and digital and so on. Um, I'd say that's sort of kind of quite mainstream stuff. Uh, this is not mainstream, deliberately so, um, but as a result, the gift you get is that you can go back to your organisation and assert what you can say as you know, new knowledge, new information, new insight from yourselves as your own, as indeed I am now about to do. Uh, so there we go. So yeah, that's, that's um, neurodiversity is the topic. And, and in this, there is a, a provocation, as in what can you do to people in your team, in your organisation? around neurodiversity, um, uh, what unconscious biases might you have, but also a gift in that, in a world of repeatable precision, AI and automation, etc., well, um, innovation will come from the edges. It will be the mistakes, it won't be the obvious. Innovation will come from the edges. That's the kind of the core thought in all of this. Neurodiversity, as a thing, talks to some things that quite in the news, uh, dyslexia, dyspraxia, ADHD, autism, Asperger's, and so on. Quite closely annexed to mental health issues, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So already from the start, this is something a little bit different, right? But it's surprisingly common, and, and there are arguments that these, these stats are undercalled, particularly around dyslexia, uh, more towards two in 10. So it's a number of people. Uh, and I talk about this being the diversity conversation that has yet to happen. And it's really important for me to say that diverse, all forms of diversity are equal from a social justice perspective. And as an organisation, we're very active on age, gender, sexuality, ethnicity. But my hypothesis is that from a performance potential perspective, understanding how you tap into very different brains, very different ways of thinking, is where there's some real gold, untapped gold. And further still, many people with neurodiversity over-index on hyper-intelligence, but also mental health issues. So the, the gap in potential field is massive. As an insurer, we have a lot of autistic folks in our pricing and actuarial function. We have quite a few dyslexic people in our, in our marketing function. Uh, and then there's a couple of entry points for me into this whole conversation as well. But I think there's, a, there's an untapped performance potential, which means that, yes, all equal from a social justice perspective, but this inner, this invisible battle against this particular form of diversity and discrimination is a particularly rich one. Okay, so um, entry point uh, is my daughter is dyslexic. This is uh, a picture of some eye art she does. God knows how she does it. Uh, she's got, I don't know, tens of thousands of followers on Instagram. Really proud of her. But the point is I've seen the journey she's gone on, which is one of believing that she was stupid, which many people with neurodiversity believe. They believe that they are stupid because conventional education doesn't really help you very much. And it highlights the things that you find hard that make that look very easy to others. And it doesn't highlight the brilliant things you can do that other people find very hard to do. And that uh, is very tough, particularly for teenage, teenagers to go through. And then there's the epiphany. At some point in time, for many people in neurodiversity, they realize that they have a superpower. And that superpower becomes defining for them in terms of what they're really good at, they should do more of, they should build their careers around. And many, many dyslexic people and many neurodiverse people have much more of a lightning rod perspective on what their career is going to be than many people like myself who kind of amble through serendipity and all that. Uh, so superpowers is that thought experienced through my daughter. The other entry point is, is one around diversity. I, I, arguably, I've got a different entry point into diversity, which is I'm a rugby guy through and through, but I believe that rugby is, uh, was you know, talking to diversity before the, com the conversation even really, even really started. In that, rugby is about all shapes and sizes, all coming together, lots of different skills contribute to the whole, lots of com camaraderie um, and uh, collaboration, em empowerment of decisions in the moment, and you win and lose together. Okay? Uh, and, and also, in our organisation, within Direct Line, we've had a lot of success. I believe one of the reasons that we've had a lot of success is that when we formed our values, we put one right at the heart, which is bring all of yourself to work, shorthand being just enable people to be the best them. And in development conversations, don't focus on the things that people can't do, focus on their spikes, their super strengths, their superpowers, the things that they can do, and find ways to enable them to do more of them. 
So there's a, there's a couple of entry points, but really I think that this is potentially all for the fluff of it, in my mind, unless there was a performance angle to this, you know, an edge. So let's just talk about the world we live in. So uh, there's this notion of robotization, automation. It's in the news every single day. So here's this thought that, you know, oh, four million jobs could be lost within 10 years. And there's, there's a wide spectrum of suggested suggestions and hypotheses about the extent to which automation will take over. Okay, in fact, you can go to the BBC and type in, will a robot take your job or take my job? And it will predict, put your job title in, it will predict the likelihood with which indeed your job will be automated. But this sounds theoretical, but actually it's real. So here's an example. This uh, factory in Taiwan makes all the iPhones for China. That's a lot of iPhones. Just started the three-stage automation process, which results in 44,000 robots and not a single human being. This is all the iPhones in China. So this is real. An exponential acceleration of technologies means that it's become, going to become more and more prevalent. And on AI specifically, here we are that AI is more accurate at detecting cancer, making medical breakthroughs, more accurate at predicting heart attacks than all the testing available in the world as we see it today. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Maybe less amazing, but perhaps not to be unexpected. Uber's got AI that runs underneath that knows exactly what you'll pay. <coughs> They've sussed you out and they optimise their pricing to the maximum amount that you will be prepared to pay. But you didn't know that. And back in insurance, it's not impossible, as you can see here, that the process to assess somebody's risk can use AI to do that. Um, so in this case, uh, a selfie would allow you to get life insurance. Okay. And it just takes, you know, not infinite data, but billions of data points or many data points to get you there. So, so it kind of gets to this notion. Uh, so uh, with neural networks, which is sort of the, the now the dominant branch of AI, now winning through, uh, they're getting more and more sophisticated in the extent to which AI can sort of replicate human processing power. So it takes 15 layers of a neural net to distinguish between a cat and a dog. It's actually quite hard to do. It takes 100 layers of a neural net to get to beat the best in the world at the game Go, the Japanese, Chinese game Go, a thousand times more complicated than chess. But by 2029, one neural network computer will have more processing power than a human brain. I don't know if that's remarkable or not, but what is remarkable is that by 2049, one neural network computer will have more processing power than all the human brains put together. I guess you could say enjoy the next 20 years. So, but more to the point, marketing as a discipline is being pretty challenged at the moment. How can you be as creative as you always were? Because in the end, you need to create relationships with customers, engage customers. That's never going to go away but at the same time be more data-driven, more rigorous, more analytical, demonstrate the marketing's an investment, not a cost. Connect with the commercial reality of a business. And there's various people who say, well, that's great, we need whole brain marketers. I say, impossible. Brains don't do that. Actually, there is a guy in our team who's got autism and dyslexia, jackpot. He can do both, but it's extremely rare. Most people have a tendency or a super strength in one area or the other. And to expect individuals to be able to do both is pretty much impossible, or at least setting yourself up for fail. Whereas the role of the marketing leader is to bring, build whole brain marketing teams, bring the left brain and the right brain together, bring the extremes together, and to actively seek neurodiversity. And I think marketing needs to lead, lean into this and lead this charge into neurodiversity. Marketing tends to be more diverse by all dimensions. So why not really embrace and leverage this one? And here's the thing about superpowers. It's a little bit jaggedy, you can't see it perfectly. But here's the superpowers that neurodiversity brings. So dyspraxia, which you, is seen as sort of sometimes a bit clumsy, the kid that's a bit clumsy in sports. Actually, the main thing is that they learn in a multi-sensory way, but are eminently capable of massive leaps and breakthroughs in thinking. Dyslexic people who are seen as, um, you know, unconventionally struggle in reading and processing, you know, real-time processing of data, but incredibly inherently creative, uh, and so on and so forth. And so all of these things kind of have a, a flip, a promise and a peril, or a, a weakness and a strength. And it's doing that, that uh, finding that epiphany to turn the, the challenge into the opportunity. And um, 
as soon as I put this chart up, I'll use a caveat. I, I agree this isn't the most diverse group of individuals in the world. Uh, hopefully, all the other aspects of diversity that are being challenged will mean that in years to come, this will be much more balanced in all regards, because this is obviously a bunch of white males. But nonetheless, the point is, all those on the left uh, autistic, and some dyslexic as well. Einstein was, was both. And, and all those on the right are dyslexic. So some of the most amazing inventors in the world have had neurodiversity conditions, benefits. I don't even know what the right terminology is. But they've been able to make creative leaps. And OK, so that's the pinnacle point. But the truth goes all the way through in terms of people whose brains are wired differently will think about problems differently. Okay? So um, I'm going to show you a couple of reference points of what, how that manifests. So here's somebody, I don't know, if it, some people in the room might use consumer intelligence, you know, data, I don't know. Anyway, you may or may you not. But the CEO of consumer intelligence, who's failed a couple of times in different startups and now done pretty well, he, he's the first one I heard talking about this idea of a superpower. Yeah? It enables me to see the world differently. I see the world in a way that you cannot imagine it's possible to see the world. I have to trust him and believe him, <laughs> and he's done some pretty cool things with it. But he says, my success is because of my neurodiversity, not despite my neurodiversity. Okay, lovely story. A lady called Pip Jameson, one of the soon-to-be billionaires. Um, she's founded a thing called The Dots, which is the next LinkedIn, but a much more intuitive, um, expressive format than LinkedIn, which particularly for the creative industries will be a much better tool, frankly, than LinkedIn. Uh, she's now being touted, you know, being uh, courted by uh, VCs and so on. Anyway, struggled at school, struggled to get into university, found her niche, got a first. Hmm, interesting. Wrote a letter to her dad, said, I told you, I was, I told you I'm a genius. Well, actually, she said, wrote a letter to her dad saying, I told you I'm a Guinness. And there you have it. All of it right there. Okay, so there's a and then other people, so Jamie Oliver, who says, you know, you're lucky if you've got dyslexia. Dyslexics are brilliant at simplifying things down. So if, who's read Jamie's five, you know, five book? Yeah, how he takes very complex recipes and make them into five ingredients. Yeah, okay. It's just his brain's wired for it. You could say he's amazingly creative, or you could just say, well, that's just the way his brain works. And then a couple of videos. So this is fo primarily focusing on dyslexia, so I, uh, I, I could go down another avenue, but just to show you a couple of... Uh, videos that really help to bring it to life. So let's just play a couple of videos. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to have a chat to you about dyslexia. Anyone be interested in having a dyslexic baby? What the hell kind of a question is that? The world's first dyslexic sperm bank. Open today. Hello, good morning. What's brought you in today? Just a bit intrigued, actually. <laughs> Tell me, what do you know about dyslexia? I don't know, does that get jumbled up with writing? In that disability? You're kind of siphoned off and put in the, the special room. A lot of people think that people with dyslexia are stupid. I've heard that word used a lot. Given the choice, yeah. would you like your child to have dyslexia? No. I wouldn't kill it. I have a restaurant. Right. My head chef is dyslexic. Okay. And there's certain things I just wouldn't give him to do at all. Only 3% of people see dyslexia as anything other than a disadvantage. But look at the people around this room. Steve Jobs, co-founder of Apple, inventor of the iPhone. Who's more of an icon for genius than Albert Einstein? We've got a whole catalogue here full of people who uh, are or were dyslexic, like Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, Alexander Graham Bell, who invented the telephone. Dyslexics have a difference in their brains that makes them literally see the world a bit differently. Quite a lot of good-looking ones. Love. Slightly jealous. <laughs> Did you know that 40% of self-made millionaires are dyslexic? Say that again. What? That's amazing. It hasn't held any of them back. And the value of these individuals and their contribution to all areas is just really yeah. encouraging. And all of these dynamic achievers need to be given up as positive examples. It does not need to be a barrier to achievement. If you were thinking about how most people see dyslexia, what, what words do you think people would use to describe them? Uh, at a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. But by the sounds of it, they're not.
Okay, cool, eh? Forty uh, percent of self-made millionaires dyslexic. It was until ten years ago uh, having dyslexia was a screening question for sperm banks. Hence, the whole idea. But the point is, in your team, teams, maybe even in you, undiagnosed, I don't know. Um, are you missing a trick in terms of a creative spark that leap through, leap that breakthrough innovation? Here's here's a here's another one. Five years ago, I was diagnosed as having been dyslexic for my entire life, and um, which explained a lot of things. It was like the last puzzle part mm -hmm. in a tremendous mystery that I've kept to myself all these years. Yeah. That basically started with just things that happen when you're a kid in school and you're a slow reader. Yeah. And in my case, I was actually um, in a uh, unable to read for for at least two years, uh, I was two years behind the rest of my class. And of course I went through what everybody goes through, yeah. is teasing. Yeah. And I had to go through that for a long time. And so the teasing, you know, led to a lot of other problems I was having in school. But it all stemmed from the fact that I was embarrassed yeah. to stand up in front of the class and, 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 and read. Just that it's more common than, you th than, than, than you've ever could, could imagine. Mm -hmm. And that you're not alone. Yeah. And that uh, there are ways to uh, ac accelerate your reading skills, to accelerate your comprehension, mm -hmm. and there are ways to deal with it. It's not an incurable thing. It's something you're going to have the rest of your life, but you can sort of, you know, dart between the raindrops to get where you want to go, yeah. and it will not hold you back. Yeah. Isn't that lovely? Dart between the raindrops. I mean, I've never come up with that sort of expression, but again, it's sort of intuitive. Last, last one, perhaps best for last. Well, I'll let you be the judge, but let's see. Yeah, and did you ever doubt yourself? Well, quite an amusing story uh, is that age 50, uh, we had the biggest private group of companies in Europe. Um, and, uh, and I had a board meeting. And, uh, and in the board meeting, uh, somebody gave me some figures for one of our companies. And I said, is that, is that good news or bad news? And um, and one of my directors looked at me and said, Richard, you don't know the difference between net and gross, do you? And, and, um, and, and I went, OK, well, you know, I hadn't admitted it to anybody, but I, I didn't. So he pulls out a bit of paper and he, he, had, he brought some crayons in. So he colours the piece of paper in blue and, said, and then he puts a net in the, in the, in the blue sea and, says, um, and then he puts a little fish in the net and he says, the, the fish in the net, uh, they are at your profit at the end of the year. And the rest of the sea, uh, where the f where, which are outside the net, that's your turnover. And suddenly I went, okay, I now know the difference between net and gross. Um, but um, but I think the you know the good thing about that story is you can build <laughs> the biggest group of private companies in Europe without knowing the difference between net and gross, um, uh, because you know what is a company? A company is simply creating a product that makes a difference to other people's lives, and if you can create you know, a better company than other people that make a difference to other people's lives, the money will come in and then you can find somebody else to count the money up at the end of the year and hopefully more money's come in than has gone out. Um, but um, once I knew the difference between net and gross, I realised we weren't making quite as much profit as I thought, so I thought it was the other way around. So. There you go. Who'd have thought? Fish, fish and ocean. But um, lovely, isn't it? So, so this, this is moving into a mainstream conversation. Uh, so not so long ago, Harvard Business Review talking about neurodiversity as a competitive advantage, not specifically in marketing or digital marketing, but more broadly. And there are some organisations that have really embraced this. So what I wanted to do, because I'm basically I campaign on this, because I think it's sort of a, a, a trick that's missed, but I also think it is the conversation that needs to come into the spotlight. Um, so there are basically three things that you can do in your organisation, in your team, where, wherever it would help. Um, the first is, is an obvious one, which is around raising awareness. Um, it's not that hard to get your head around this as a concept, as a, an unspoken conversation that needs to happen. Uh, and so uh, the easiest way to do that is find people who come in and speak about it. Uh, we did an invisible fight week, actually it was last week, about many issues that are sort of hidden from view, um, heart health, uh, mental health and so on. And we actually had Pip Jamieson, the I am a Guinness, who came in and talked about her journey. And again, for her, the role that the challenge of overcoming dyslexia and then the role it's played in her success. So that's quite straightforward, because I think unless it's in the conversation, part of the everyday conversation, then it's, it's something that's essentially hidden. 
the second one, which is a bit more challenging, is to support people managers in how to manage people with neurodiversity, because it's not always straightforward. Uh, so I'll, I'll give an example. There's somebody in my team who manages somebody who's got autism, and that person is absolutely brilliant at focusing in on data analytics tasks, but essentially needs to be told to have breaks, told to go to lunch, told to go home, sometimes even told to go to the toilet. And it's incredibly literal in a way that might appear to be rude to manage that person. Uh, so if you, know, if you went up to them and said, Look, you know, I really need this today, I could do with this today, but you didn't actually say, do it today, you'd never get it. Because literally you have not been prescriptive. So there are just some subtleties there. So building the support mechanisms, because ultimately people work for people. People don't work for organisations or cultures, or whatever. People work for people. So people managers need to be a bit upskilled in this to get the most out of their neurodiverse folks. And then the last is around recruitment, which is actually really challenging because typical recruitment processes will systematically disadvantage people with neurodiversity. Um, asking uh, you know, somebody who's dyspraxic to kind of think on their feet. Well, fair enough. If that's the role, that's a good thing to test. If that's not the role, that systematically will be a disaster. Um, so there are, there are ways and means around that. And for us, we've had some success in having sort of a pre-meeting to talk about what gives a le level playing field. Not to overly advantage, but tr try to avoid s systemically disadvantage. So there are really, really th three really, really simple things you can do. And, and there, as I said, there are some companies that are sort of gold standard. So SAP would be the one, particularly in regards to autism, they've created, and they, I guess they've got the global resources to do this, uh, you know, a whole coaching, mentoring, buddying, uh, screening, recruitment process. <laughs> and, and they will talk quite loudly about the benefits that they've got from doing that. Okay, so it's not like nobody's ever really cracked it. But here's the thing, and this is sort of my main interest, which is this point about potential. Uh, in many, many cases, and I've talked to a few people now, quite a few people now, it does appear to be that the cruel part of this is that neurodiversity often over-indexes of people who are highly or hyper-intelligent and also, more, also seem to be more prone to mental health issues. And I've got no idea what's the cause and effect in all of this. But my passion would be to try and prove in research that this exists, because this could be then used to challenge some aspects of our education system and so on and so forth. But this is as yet unproven, but I think it's a pretty reasonable hypothesis from having talked to many. Um, so you end up with this notion that in a world where everybody believes diversity is the right thing, or it's certainly they hope they do, you know, be, be kind, everyone you meet is fighting a great battle, which is a lovely quote maybe to end the day. I know you've had lots of stimulus and this is a bit left field, but there's a nice quote to end the day. But underneath that, this is how you get the best out of your people. Uh, and as a twist on that, to get the very best of innovation from the edges, I think neurodiversity is something that everybody should wake up to a bit and be a bit more curious about and understand how it relates to their context, their organisation, their team and individuals within their team. So be kind, everyone you meet is fighting a great battle, particularly people with neurodiversity. Thank you for listening.